excavations at 42 to 51 Strand Street, Great, and 31 to 34 Abbey Street, Upper. So I undertook this excavation in 2019 in advance of the proposed development of two hotels on this site by the Marlott Property Group, who funded the excavation. Uh, in the normal run of things, uh, post excavation and everything will be done at this stage, but the delays of COVID mean that uh, I'm still, there's still some specialist work outstanding on, this site, on the site, so we're still uh, pulling it all together. So it's a large site, it covers about a third of a hectare extending from up here, I'll just get my pointer, uh, here we go. This is actually the uh, Jervis Street, Red Line, Lewis stop, all the way down to Great Strand Street. And it's, the site is bisected by Burns Lane, which originally extended across the full site. It had been vacant for a long time. It was first archaeologically tested by James Hessian in 2008, but no development took place. So the site, of course, lies in what was the lands of St. Mary's Abbey. And this is Speed's map, circa 1610. And we are up here near this little inlet. And this is the precinct wall of the Abbey. And really everything um, medieval that we found on the site is to do with all this that's going on up here in the medieval waterfront. So the site is, of course, adjacent to the location of Claire Walsh's 2002 excavation of a medieval timber waterfront, which some of you will probably be familiar with. It's published in Medieval Dublin 5. So on the adjacent site, Claire got a front braced timber revetment stretching across the site for 25 metres, which was dendrochronologically dated to the late 12th, early 13th century with felling dates for timbers from that site from AD 1214 and AD uh, 1203 to 1204. Claire suggested that the revetment was located to the south of that inlet in speed. And so between the inlet and the Liffey as it was at the time. So this is a, just a drawing, a plan of our site, which you'll be, become very familiar with because I need to use it quite a lot. So I'm going to start down here with revetment 93, which is of course, a very clearly a continuation of Claire's revetment. So, the survival of this uh, revetment is pretty remarkable. It was underneath a concrete tank, the surface of which had been broken out and the revetment was just millimetres below it. Uh, we, we, you can see there's a, actually, just want to point out, there's a steep rubble bank um, here behind the revetment, which is significant in what we found and what we didn't find because we couldn't remove this bank. It was supporting Burns Lane. So we just got five metres of the revetment in this area because it, it disappeared right in under here. So if we just take a closer look, five meters long with a maximum surviving height of 70 centimeters orientated east, northeast, west, west, south, west. It was built by first laying down these short transverse base plates. These are pegged in position. And then just here along them is a half lap put into their upper surface into which was set the main longitudinal base plates. The main longitudinal base plates were joined through splayed scarf joints. And the scarfs demonstrated that the, the structure was built from west to east. Then there are regularly spaced mortises in the top of those base plates, holding these substantial timber posts, and then we have our horizontal planking. Now to the other side of this structure are the raking braces, which would have supported it from the northern side, but we didn't excavate in there, but they were in there. There's an elevation of what we got of Claire's of the same revetment as Claire, including this section, which actually this is where the concrete tank had impacted on it, but it did actually run beyond it. Here's the revetment as we were dismantling it. Um, this behind it here are just bands of clays and gravels. The deposits that we took off on the opposite side were exactly the same. And that is the same situation that Claire had on her site. The timbers or the planking of the revetment aren't nailed together. It has to be held in place by deposits, but there's no, there were no difference in the deposits on either side of the development of the revetment. It's clays and gravels and just standard riverine deposits. So that's where we started here, Context 93, very definitely a continuation of the uh, revetment that Claire excavated. This should have run underneath the gravel bank and come out around here and tried as we did, we could not find that revetment anywhere. It did not exist in this area at all. However, about 20 meters north, we found parallel two to three lines of different revetments or possibly the same. So the survival in this part of the site is much poorer and we're just down to foundation level. Really, we've just got the subsidiary base plates, the posts, and then some of the main base plates and some tiny, tiny bits of planks here. So we have this northernmost revetment along this line, and then we have one to the south here. 
These were all covered by successive layers of riverine deposits, so clays and gravels, and a really, really compact layer of, of gravel on top of all these. So the best surviving is the more, northernmost line, context 83, which is the remains of a front brace for Vetman. So this is built with the same orientation and in the same manner as our revetment over in our corner and Claire's revetment on the adjacent site. That's just to show you the survival. So the posts survive really well because they were driven down into the underlying nice uh, damp silty clays, but the rest of the revetment is largely gone. So this is the detail of our northernmost revetment context 83. These are our subsidiary base plates here. These are the chase mortises at the ends. These are angled and they would have held the raking braces to support the planking. This here is just the remains of the plank. That's the only plank remnants that we got in this part of the, in this part of the site. So four samples from this revetment were submitted for dating. Only one had stopped wood and that returned a date of AD 1206-1207. And so we are, we are contemporary with the revetment on the site next door. So just hopping onto the next slide. This is our southernmost revetment. This survives really, really poorly. It's two meters south from that last revetment, but it's important. So I'll just show you, probably I know these are just photos of gray. So what you can see is those two lines there are the remains of the subsidiary base plates. And then longitudinally between them, we have just the scant remains of either a base plate or planking. It really is just the shadow. What's important about this is this base, the, this subsidiary base plate here is the way it's orientated. We have the half lap here that would have held the main longitudinal base plate. And so this revetment was facing in the opposite direction with the planking facing north, okay? And what you can also see actually in this photo here is the difference in deposits. This is the river side. And this is all these orange gravels. And over here, this is the silty side. Now, bearing in mind, we've lost all the strata associated with these uh, revetments. We only have the foundation levels on which they were built. But this difference in uh, river deposits is quite typical of the site. The southern side of the site, much more gravels. The northern side of the site, much more silt, suggestive of slower moving water and slower deposition and buildup of deposits in that site. So moving into the very northeast corner of the site, the preservation was once more really good. This is our northernmost revetment context 83, and here it survives to 75 centimetres in height. We've got a lot of reused timbers in here, and um, we've got a couple of ship or uh, boat timbers are built into it here, but we've got really good, but really well preserved in this part of the site. And this entire section of the revetment has actually been, been retained for conservation and future display. Just to show you then some of the carpentry details and the really crisp preservation of the timbers in this part of the site. So that's two of the main base plates joined with the scarf joint and pegged together. This is one of the subsidiary base plates then. You can see um, when, we, when we started to dismantle, this is the base plates with those lovely mortises, just really, really good preservation up here. And then just this little picture here, um, this is kind of unusual. This is the, the looking south. And we can see here and here, the revetment has actually been plugged with two stones. So there is an elevation of this revetment and this is it at its very Eastern end within the site where it was incorporated into a wall or a stone plinth. And I'll be getting to that again shortly. Ah, here we go. So this is, the, you can see our plank built revetment here. We've got this sort of collapsed, disturbed stone structure here. And then just below that, we have this very uh, formal square, like a, like a big plinth, a consolidation of that revetment. So that's incorporating the end of the revetment and it is the end of the revetment. So coming back to this plan then here, the third line of revetment. So this is this is the nice plank built structure that we we're just looking at. This is the stone plinth up here. This is the really poorly preserved revetment that hardly survives at all, but the base plates are coming out in the opposite direction. So we're looking at two lines of planking along here. But running alongside this one, we had a very, very poorly preserved wattle fence, which as we came into this part of the site was actually quite well preserved. So that is a view of this wattle fence. So sorry, looking at my, for my notes here. So we've got this really, well, it's a fairly rough wattle fence, really. Um, this has got periods of episodic rebuilding 
in an environment like that, that might be happening, like it could be happening even seasonally. So you can see, you know, there's this, the different bands of wattle and there are areas where we can see that the uppermost stakes have been, or the po additional posts have been driven in to increase the height. We've had a radiocarbon date on that. So AD 1014 to 1254. So we are, we are in and around the same, same time period. So behind the plastic there is our plank revetment. And then at two meters in front of it, we have this wattle revetment. Between the two of these is just sterile gray clays and alluvium deposits. So this line of revetment originally started out, or certainly on the, in the other side of the site to the west, this had uh, uh, used timbers. And it does seem based on the preservation that the wattle replaced the timbers, which is kind of an unusual uh, sequence, but that, that it d does just seem to what has happened. Uh, potentially, maybe if that timber planking revetment failed quite quickly, perhaps due to the, the Liffey and the inundations there, that it was rapidly replaced by something that was, uh, you know, could be quick, quickly inserted and quickly built. So looking then south down the site, so this is the nice plank built revetment here. This is the wattle fence there, it's just partially covered in plastic. And I suppose what I want to draw your attention to is the foreground here. And what's clear, or what's uh, hopefully clear, is that there, there are remains of additional revetments, at least three in that area, all parallel, all running east, northeast, west, south, west. And we have one still pegged in position subsidiary base plate, but there are a line of posts to each side of that. So in that line, so there was actually a timber revetment along here at some point. We've had a dendrochronological date on that timber. There's no sapwood, but it does have 137 years and the suggested best estimated felling date is after AD 1235. There is also in this area a line of uh, timber posts and blocks of stone, very heavily disturbed, fairly scrappy, but it is nonetheless, there's a stone and timber structure in, in this area as well. And there's also, which is probably a little earlier, this again, really scrappy wattle fence just behind our plank uh, revetment there, which has been dismantled at this point, and this again, this is really scrappy wattle, like thorny forked branches. This isn't coming from nice coppice sources. There's not really much care taken with these, but, they're non but they are nonetheless there. Whether or not these are actually revetments, um, I don't know. It, it could be that some of these are actually kind of temporary works almost. They may have been put in to help consolidate the ground and manage the water levels a little uh, to facilitate the, the building of the more formal and the bigger revetments. So what are these all about and what's going on? So here is Claire's Walsh's revetment coming across her site and here it is coming into our site. We have nothing over here. We can't find that revetment here, but we have these revetments to the north. There's a small kink on Burn Lane just here where our revetment disappears. And I'm suggesting that our revetment took a turn and that turn is echoed in the kink in the lane. Now we only have one line of revetment down here in the southwest corner, so this is totally a hypothesis, but if there had been a second, it would have been removed by the building of the precinct wall, which I'm going to get to shortly. So if these two revetments were contemporary, they would have formed a substantial boundary uh, with parallel plank shuttering and then the infill clays in between them, bearing in mind we didn't find any of that because we are down to foundation level in here. So, as I said earlier, Claire suggested that her revetment was south of the inlet on speed. I agree with that. I think that these are features are all south of the inlet, inlet, shoring up the ground here, and that the inlet is driving the mill on this site. And this is really what it's all about. And just to add in, the development of the proposed development for this site has actually changed. And I'm going to be getting in here to excavate shortly. So, watch this space and we'll see if our theory on this is right. So I mentioned the mill. As we were carrying out our excavation, Ian Russell of ACSU Limited was excavating this on the adjacent site. Absolutely incredible uh, water mill. And I have to thank Ian for allowing me to share images of the site. The mill hasn't been dated yet. Presumably it's late 12th, early 13th century. It's a vertically undershot mill built with stone and timber. This photo is centered on the wheel pit. So the wheel is turning here in this area with stone underneath it. Gears and mechanisms are over here. This is the head race. This is where the water is entering into the mill to drive that wheel. And then this is the tail race. This is where the water is leaving. So just a second view of that mill there looking up to the west or the west or the west-northwest. This is a 
head race, water is coming down in here, it's driving the wheel here, and then the water is coming out here in the tail race. And if you just see this base plate here, my site is, so my site's here, and this is, all my revetments are leading up to this here behind this pile wall. And if you just notice that timber base plate there, that is the timber base plate entering into our site. And you can see there's some nice little bit of joinery there. And that is the end of my revetment completely flush with that timber base plate. And this is our revetment, which is then at a slightly later date, consolidated or fortified with this stone structure. So there is a formal gap or opening in the revetment, which I'm suggesting is a sluice or certainly an access point of some kind. And the water movement and the pressure up in this area is causing the need for the reinforcement of the revetment in this place. So that's just a plan there showing uh, the end of the revetment. And I should have added actually earlier, the revetment is picked up against, uh, again across here. So Ian did have the revetment, albeit quite disturbed. And also this wattle uh, structure did cross into Ian's site and it became very complex over here. Or certainly there's a wattle structure in line with ours over here. So it's all tied together and we're, we're both still, still working on really what all this truly means. So, Back to the final revetment of, um, on our site, which is Context 300, which is down here. Now, this is built in the same manner as the other revetments that we found, but it's in totally different orientation. This is orientated northwest, southeast. All attempts to find the revetment in this area failed. There just wasn't there. We did not find it at all. And down in this area here, it had been extensively disturbed by an 18th century rob trench uh, and also then heading here towards where there was an electricity substation, a big rubble bank that we couldn't go near at all. But I think it's likely that uh, there's a good possibility that this uh, revetment does survive in that area. Here it is, here is an excavated. Um, so it survived to 70 centimeters in height. The upright elements were gone as were the bracers or the raking braces, but the base plates were still pegged in position and the planks were still in place. Um, like I said, the rest of it was robbed out, and there we have our dating sequence. We didn't get any um, sapwood, but the average estimated felling date for this structure will be AD 1206 plus or minus nine years. So we are contemporary with what is happening elsewhere on the site. This has to be to do with, again, this is to do with the mill. This has to be to do with water management and managing, consolidating the ground in this area. This is more or less parallel to the tail race of that mill where there's going to be a strong flow of water coming in out in that direction. So we are done with the revetments or temporarily at least, and moving on to what we believe to be the precinct wall of St. Mary's Abbey. So this ran across the southern part of the site on the same east, northeast, west, southwest orientation. And it's a substantial stone wall. So this is the full extent of it as we got on the site. And you can see its preservation varies quite considerably. The surviving length on the site is just over 44 metres and it was 2.2 to 2.3 metres wide. It survived to a maximum height of 80 centimetres but as little as 10 centimetres in places and you can see in some places it is entirely gone. So it really is best described as the foundations of a wall and this was entirely covered by river gravels and importantly the uppermost surviving level of the wall was below the level of the base plates of the revetment. So this popped up at a lower level than our 13th century revetments. That's just an aerial shot there overlooking the wall. So you can see it's a really, really substantial structure. And then a couple of different views there on the left, we're looking west towards uh, Claire's site where there was no trace of the wall was found. And you can see in the foreground, the wall is almost entirely gone. You can also see this uh, spread of rubble, which is displaced material, at least uh, caused in part, at least I think probably by inundation and tides. So the Liffey is over here, the inlet is up here, okay? Um, but it's also quite truncated in this area. There's a couple of wells have gone down through it and it's been taken out by post-medieval activity. So where it did survive in good condition, it was built with large dressed facade blocks containing internal basal box blocks and slabs over which was an internal rubble core. So you can see that there. The facade blocks were mostly rectangular and they were laid with their long axes set into the wall center. Maximum of four courses surviving and that we got one possible pocket of mortar which is currently being analyzed. 
At the very east northeastern end of the wall, it was almost entirely robbed out in the 18th century, presumably used to build some of the uh, foundations of the Georgian houses on the site. Banked up against the northern side of the wall, so on this side of the wall, we had an organic rich deposit which contained an assemblage of 13th century pottery. Analysis of that deposit by Penny Johnson suggests it's natural in origin with uh, lots of seeds from the varieties of wild plants which would typically grow in damp meadows. But it is uh, the deposit with, that we got the largest medieval assemblage uh, from. We didn't get that many medieval, uh, art, much of a medieval artifact assemblage at all on the site, but we did get it from that deposit. So how does all this fit in to what we know about the precinct wall of the Abbey? And here I have to acknowledge there are many scholars who know far more about St. Mary's Abbey than I, in particular Geraldine Stout, whose 2012 Medieval Dublin article I am relying on quite heavily here. So looking once more at Speed's map, here is the inlet enclosed by the Abbey precinct. Geraldine tells us there were three phases of building of the precinct. The first after, uh, after AD 1216, the second when the South Keys were fortified in 1317, and that was in response to the threat of the Bruce invasion, and this wall would have enclosed the inlet. And then finally in 1455, in relation to the building of a tower at the pier of St. Mary's. So I don't have an exact date for the wall we found. I have a sample of a twig from between two horizontal stones, which is currently in a dating lab in Queen's University, but I don't have a date yet. And dating a wall that has been subject to riverine inundation is risky, but I suppose what time will tell. We did, however, get a single shard of 13th century Dublin type wear from within the wall. Again, acknowledging that you know, this wall has had disturbance on it. You know, there's been river inundation, which I think is probably the riskiest thing. Um, even acknowledging that the shirt of pottery was well stratified. The archaeologists took it out. We're absolutely confident that it went in, that it was really in with the fabric of the wall. Um, I welcome people's thoughts on this because it's, it's a difficult thing to date, to date a dry stone wall. But um, whether or not that piece of pottery anyway definitively dates the wall, of course, is debatable. Um, so, but returning again to what we know about the wall and what uh, thankfully Geraldine has, uh, has researched and told us about the wall, it seems likely that this could be part of the second phase of building and closing the South Keys in 1317. So the section of wall that we found is the longest section of the precinct wall that has been found to date. However, in researching the site, I have discovered what I think is a substantial section of it on Strand Street Little. This was excavated by Helen Kyo in 2004 and interpreted as a path. Now these photos from Helen's site show the remains of a 13th century timber revetment orientated northeast southwest, immediately to the east of which, so that is the river side, is a substantial stone structure 2.2 meters wide. Now I only just found this report and I do need to look at this in more detail, but the location, the position of the revetment and the stone structure together and the very nature of that stone structure on Helen's site, I'm pretty confident that this is a section of the precinct wall. So again, um, what does all this mean? So now I thank my colleague, Johnny Ryan, who has been working on the mapping of this for me. And here in this image, Johnny has simply overlaid the results of our excavation onto Speed's map with what I think are quite good results. We're suggesting that the revetments came in and they take a turn uh, take a turn up here to come quite up close to the inlet and the inlet is coming in and feeding the mill and here is our wall overlaid on the line of speed. But taking that one step further and including the evidence from Strand Street Little and from Helen's excavation, Johnny has used the outline of the precinct wall from Speed's map as a base to extrapolate where the wall might be. So he first tried to locate the footprint of Speed's version and lay it out on rope and then from there on onto the modern map. So using the plans from Helen's site, he has adjusted the line of the precinct from speed. So he's, he's tilted it slightly to incorporate her evidence and line up with what we think is the wall in this location. Johnny then projected the lines of the two walls and they actually met somewhere out in the Liffey. So a working hypothesis here is that there might be an additional turn in the wall along Strand Street. But like I say, we just found we just found the evidence from Helen's site and we're still working on this. So then finally, just to add in the inlet from speed, which of course is what, what this is all about, or certainly what my site is all about. We don't know at this point, and maybe we never will, if the wall on 
Helen site is north or south of the inlet. We plotted it here, running north of it. But there are also have been revetments or uh, traces of revetments found along here. So we're suggesting that uh, the final conclusion, I suppose, is that the inlet is coming here. Uh, revetments are, are forming a, an embankment on one side of it here, and that is later replaced by the wall here on this site. And this is, I suppose, then our medieval shoreline uh, from, the, from the 13th century onwards. So I hope I haven't been talking far too quickly. I possibly have. Um, apologies if I was rushing through things. I felt like I had an awful lot to get through. Um, it just uh, remains for me to thank Medieval Dublin and all these beautiful people who contributed to the excavation. Thank you.